Unmute, are we good to go? Test, 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 yep. Oh. Yeah, testing, one, two, yeah. testing. Is it high enough? Are you going higher? Lapels. Beckett was actually... Looks good, it's Jerusalem Cross, yeah. Looks very good on you. Right, Disneyland. <laughs> we'll give everybody a few minutes to find their way in so you guys can keep talking amongst yourselves. <laughs> You got quiet. That's fine. They're welcome to. I just we let everybody get kids dropped off and get settled. I know it's a Wednesday night. One of these days you'll wonder where. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good to be with you. I know folks will still be finding their way in, but we'll get rolling as we have a couple chapters of Luke to get to. How's everybody doing? You're good. All right. How's it sound? Man, we're good. All right. What uh, What's our live stream report there, Alyssa? Are we rolling? Thumbs up from Alyssa. Excellent. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're in chapter 5 and 6 tonight. Anything that uh, needs to be announced or told for everybody here? How was the weekend? Good? Yeah? A blessing? Yeah? Did uh, anybody attempt to baptize twins? Because uh, I did. Uh, yeah, so um, here's how this went. Um, we normally uh, do uh, the baptisms at the very beginning of the service. Um, uh, but something had happened. There was car issues, and they couldn't get here, so we moved the baptism to the end. Well, these, little, these twins are like five years old, uh, and they wanted to be immersed. 
So we had the, you know, our fancy horse trough out uh, for the immersion at 9.30, and we do pour like warm water in there about 15, 20 minutes before the service so that it's kind of tepid, so it's not super cold. Well, it sat in that room, and I don't know if you know about that room, but the room is air conditioned, especially up front where the organ is and all the choirs in their robes. Uh, and so by the time we got to the baptism, it had cooled considerably. <laughs> And so the first brother gets in the pool, uh, and the, the baptism. We get him baptized, but he comes up screaming and crying, <laughs> which is not a response that you want to a baptism. And his twin brother said no and ran for the door. <laughs> so that's how my weekend went. You know, I don't know how y'all's weekend. He did. Grandma has a really good first step. Grandma tracked him down and got him back. We baptized him just by, he didn't go in. We just sprinkled him. So, uh, lesson learned on the pastor. Well, no, we're working on it, Pastor Greg. We're talking about a baptismal thing that might actually be heated. So, we're working on that. Uh, this one. And I know there's some Baptists that were in the audience that were just like, you guys are amateurs. Uh, Methodist people don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, they, they were, had goggles on and like swim shirts on too, which was awesome, I thought. Like, I'm like, this is, they were ready to go. They were pumped. They touched that cold water and they were not as excited about it. <laughs> so that's how it went. It was great. They're both baptized. Jesus wins. It was just uh, moments of holy terror for their pastor. Now you know why the Catholics do it. Yeah, I'm for it. Um, the Orthodox do immersions with the babies. Have you seen this? They scream the whole time, but they're just, they're prepped and ready for it. I was unprepared for the screaming. Yeah. Vignus, whose side are you on? What are you doing? We heard it on the way back to lunch. Yeah, it, it, it's on the live stream. Uh, did, did we cut it or is it still on there? It's still on there. My concern is we're never going to get another kid to be immersed in this church again. Like when they... They're forcibly baptizing people at the University Methodist Church. So kids screaming no as he's running for the door. Yeah, the kids afterwards gave me a hug. We were cool. Uh, we're all right. Uh, Mom and Dad, luckily, were both veterans, so they stayed calm under the whole situation. But I think other parents might have lost it, but they stayed really calm. They'd been in worse situations. Um, all right, so we're going to do Luke uh, 5 and 6 uh, and have some conversation about it. Anything else for the good of the effort? There's the sign-in. There's the basket to invest in Wednesday night meals, uh, ministers of the church. There's prayer cards up here for people that are going through some stuff that you can be a part of. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else out there that you need, but that's the stuff I know. Anything else, Alyssa or Megan, announcement wise? Diapers. diapers. We're in the diaper drive. We're trying to get 50,000 diapers for Texas Diaper Bank, which are in a coalition of diaper banks since, like, when the hurricane happened, like in South Carolina, North Carolina. If you recall what happened here, things like diapers run out quick. So, a lot of those, uh, just uh, if you have diapers, um, we're part of that. And then uh, I think you've heard about our sign campaign. You can sponsor a square foot of sign or a half square foot. Or a square inch, uh, as we up yet our electronic signs. We're excited about that. All right, let's pray. God, uh, we thank you for tonight. For people who are hungry for your word, may you lay a feast for us, and may we leave uh, fed abundantly, that we might live uh, as your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Jesus, we have heard, uh, has had a pretty uh, amazing beginning to his ministry, um, and now he starts to gather other people to him um, to join in this. Uh, it's kind of a study in leadership that uh, some of the ways in which people actually grow and lead is to have people around them that can, um, can watch and they can be, have the, the successful whatever modeled for them. Uh, because lots of things that we need to know in life, right, are they're caught, not taught. Right? You've got to see them. Um, and that's part of the reason why I think Jesus has people who uh, he gets around him pretty closely. So one day, Jesus... This is 52 and right. And I'm, I got my NIRSV opened. If you got other passages, uh, other translations, and something's weird, raise your hand. Uh, as always, if you got a question, comment, reflection, uh, insight, uh, be, feel free to interrupt and uh, I will award you Jesus points uh, for so doing. One day, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, uh, which is the same as the Galilee, it has different names. And the crowds were pressing close to him to hear the word of God. He saw two boats moored by the land, and the fishermen... Get a little echo, Megan. Is it a little echoey? Yeah, a little bit. Um, 
the fishermen had gone ashore and were washing their nets. So they're also mending them. Uh, the nets, and this is one of my favorite things I ever discovered being in Israel, is that the, uh, the one in style of nets called the trammel net, which means nothing to you, but it's my last name. So uh, <laughs> I felt cooler. Um, but they're big and they have uh, stones that they kind of you know, bore holes in. They're on big like rope nets. Uh, they do have cast nets. They would throw those, but they'd also have big nets they'd hold between boats and kind of drag between a boat to pick up. You know, that's, so when you, these, are, these are big operations here. This is commercial fishing. Uh, the fish of this place would be salted and sent all over the place. It uh, would be a... Um, uh, a big industry there. So they're washing their nets. Uh, Jesus gets into one of the boats. It was Simon's and asked him to put out a little way from the land. Then he sat down in a boat and began to teach the crowd. They may not know this, but you don't want to whisper any secrets to anyone when you're on a boat <laughs> because sound carries on the water. You can hear a conversation in a boat. If it's, you know, if it's windy, the things will change. But if you're in calm situation, you're on a boat, that water uh, will bounce that sound back up. And what Jesus is doing, this is, you know, got hills all around it, um, is using the natural amphitheater of the structure is to be on water and you could talk to way more people. Uh, and I'm sure Jesus' uh, EQ was awesome, Megan, on his mic. I don't know what that word means. We're always talking about the EQ. How's the EQ? So, uh, in the sound. His, he, I'm sure it was, his EQ was fantastic. So he's, he's preaching and then they can all hear him. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deeper part and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon tries to be polite, but if you know any fishermen and they've been fishing all night long and not done any well, not all that well, and you come and say, you should, you should try this, and you weren't with them, it's a bold move. That's all I said. That's just bold. Um, we were working hard all night and caught nothing, but if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they did so, they caught such a huge number of fish, the nets began to break. They signaled their partners and other boats to come and help them. So they came, filled both boats, and they began to sink. And my guess is here, the idea is that not that the boats are going to go underwater, but they're sitting lower in the water. Just like, you know, you load up a truck, the back end's going to sit lower on the tires. Same idea with the boat in the water. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees. Go away, leave me alone, Lord, I am a sinner. That's, I don't know what just happened, but it's amazing, and I probably don't deserve it. Uh, and, you know, Jesus has... Um, is operating like right in the you know wheelhouse for Peter here. He's a fisherman, um, and so this is he's speaking his love language here. He and all his companions were gripped with amazement at the catch of the fish they'd taken. This included James and John, the son of Zebedee. I love that name. Uh, who were partners with Simon? Partners with Simon. So uh, what you should hear there is these are these are not like wealthy elites, but they're also not destitute poor. And they, these are kind of small business owners, and that, that's acronistic to apply to them. But they're, they've got boats, they've got an operation, they've got people that work for them. Um, so when they leave, they're not walking away from nothing. I'm just setting that up to say, when they walk away from something, and they get back to fishing later on, uh, but, but Jesus has other plans for them. Don't be afraid, said Jesus to Simon, from now on you'll be catching people. They brought their boats in the land, they abandoned everything and followed him. Um, so a couple things jump out. Uh, one, they walk away and follow Jesus. It'll be something we see uh, from time to time of people doing. Um, and this kind of phrase, I'll make you fishers of men or fishers of people, I'll make you catch people, uh, is uh, I think a beautiful message around whatever it is that you do, whether that's the work you do or the kind of personality you have uh, or the life you've lived, there's a way in which that can be productive in God's economy, um, in his kingdom. Um, so they fished, and Jesus said, I can use that. Uh, and so whatever it is that you do, God, God, can, God can use. Um, any other questions or insights on that section? People had things they ran into? They were curious about? Yes, sir? So there's a the phrase pictures of men who use one other place in the Bible of Jeremiah. When God says he's going to send pictures of men to segregate, to, to, to catch all the people that are causing Israel to go into, um, into exile. Yeah. And I wonder if it has, you know, a meaning in, in addition to, I think we where those fish in the verse of things that is strictly evangelical. But I think if there's if there's something more going on that's causing Peter to go, oh wait a minute. This is the voice this is an echo of Jeremiah. So his question, or uh, well, your insight is that there's a, one of the reference to fishing for people that the Lord uses through the prophet Jeremiah, which 
sort of has an inverted meaning, which is I'm going to snare up and catch all those causing um, the destruction of my people. I'm trying to think of the exact phrasing, but it's something to that effect that are, you know, that are leading my people astray or some such. Um, and here is a same reference, but in a collecting those who are going to be drawn closer to God rather than the other way around. Um, I, think, I think that's certainly within the surplus of meaning of the text, I would say. Well, it there. kind of goes to what you were talking about last week, which is the curse of coming to cure. Mm -hmm. and Jeremiah says it, it's going to be, okay, we're going to catch up all these bad people and Jesus used it. I'm going to use you to bring people into the kingdom of heaven. And so the interesting thing would be, I think, is that Peter thinks he's one of those bad people. Um, and the distinction we make between the ones who might be worthy of being caught up in the nets and the ones that aren't, I'm not sure Jesus is so uh, judicious about that. He's just gathering up whoever he can get a hold of, um, and he'll turn them into good people. Uh, the, the, the cleaning process there is a whole different meaning. It's a double meaning with fishing. I don't mean fillet. Any humans don't do that. That's bad. But um, Yeah. Healing happens, verse 12. It so happened that as Jesus was in one particular town, there was a man whose body was riddled with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face. There's a lot of people falling down in front of Jesus right now. Uh, leprosy is both a physical, um, uh, debilitating skin disorder in the ancient world, and I guess still it plagues folks today in some uh, parts, uh, but also a social status. Being a leper meant you were isolated, exiled, if you want to go back to Jeremiah language, driven outside the community. Lord, he begged, if you want, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. I do want to, he said, be clean. And the leprosy disappeared immediately. So this maybe goes to what you said. We talked about this last week. Uh, but the inversion of what's clean and what's unclean. Uh, in uh, Leviticus, we get a really clear picture of the things that make something unclean, that are corrosive and unholy. A leper is ritually unclean. Jesus touches a leper, and it's pretty clear that the expectation of those well-versed in the law is that now Jesus is unclean. But the opposite happens, which goes to the inversion of the fisherman being a negative, but now it's a positive. Uh, the turning inside out of the curse uh, relative to the cure here. And to show that even maybe more in depth, Jesus instructed the man not to tell anyone, go and show yourself to the priest and make the offering commanded by Moses in connection with your healing as evidence for them. That is, become ritually clean as well as uh, physically clean. The news about Jesus, though, spread all around and large crowds came to hear him and be healed from the diseases. And he used to slip away to remote places and pray. What are you doing, Jesus? Was he, was he pulling away from the crowds? His bishop would call him and say, what are you doing? <laughs> it's Easter morning. They're all in there. Give him something good. I mean, uh, you know, pastors tend to like, go towards the crowds. People go towards the crowds. I mean, not me. I'm your humble servant. But other people... <laughs> are really drawn towards the large group of people. Uh, and Jesus, you know, not that he's not drawn to people, but when they get crowded up, he goes to a private place and pray. What, what's going on? What do you think? <laughs> I'm sorry. Kevin? People aren't people are believers. He doesn't feel like they're believers. He just wants to they just want to touch and see them. They just want to touch and see them. They're not believers. So why wouldn't Jesus want to stay and convince them to be otherwise? He knows better. That's right. He wastes less time arguing with people than I do. I think you're exactly right. I think uh, and the language I would use is, it's, and we'll watch this all the way through Luke's gospel. When people come for a transaction, Jesus doesn't seem to be interested. Right? They come for, a, I want to be healed. I want to get the good thing. I want this to happen. And this is not just first century folks around Jesus. People come to church like, I need this thing, and then I'll be on my way. Uh, Jesus seems to be offering transformation, and we'd prefer a transaction. Right. I know none of you have ever prayed, Lord, just do this, and I'll do X. Right? That's a transaction. <laughs> Amen. You've done, that's right. Somebody in the back is going to tell the truth today because we're in church. That's good. Uh, it's exactly right. We have a transactional kind of mindset. Jesus seems to be not all that impressed with that. Um, and the crowds will come for things like healings and uh, abundance. They don't necessarily want to follow where he's going. Or be about what he's about. They certainly don't understand yet, which I guess what you mean when you say they're not believers. They don't get it because the disciples don't get it yet. Uh, absolutely. Other reflections on that good stuff? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I like to think because he's in a human body, he would need a little bit of rest and restoration. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not saying 
or help the next round? I don't know where you got this notion that somehow bodies were important and that Jesus had a real one and that, um, yeah, you're totally right. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. So when we talk about Jesus' incarnation, it doesn't change him from being human. It means that the divine and human embody the same space, which is radical enough. But this is a real human, and it's not a sin or a weakness to get hungry or get tired. And Jesus would get these things. Uh, and I, I would read this as a challenge. And I'll just say, I don't know how you feel, but I've had moments in my own life where I thought, uh, man, if Jesus has to draw away to a place to rest and restore, who ever told me that I don't need to do that, to do the thing I've been called to do? Um, and this is really interesting, too, because it, it, we're about to have a conversation about the Sabbath, which is related to this, uh, but in a different way than perhaps the, those that were more concerned with law observance than spirit of the law uh, had in mind. Uh, rest and restoration are a real thing um, that Jesus sort of models both for his followers and for us. So if Jesus needs to do this, uh, we do too. Um, and that's going to look different for different people. Uh, what I'll say, and I say to my staff and other people, I was like, what, what puts gas in your tank? Um, because I don't think, I mean, Jesus doesn't, he's not taking a spa day. That's not his thing. That may be yours. I'm not opposed to a spa day. Um, Jesus is, uh, seems to do everything with great intensity and intentionality, right? He, he even rests with great intention. Um, he goes to a deserted and wild place to be uh, away from folks to, to do that. Um, and stay connected and rooted in who he is and why he's come. Right? That's what rest gives him. It's a, uh, who he is and why he's come. And this should be too shocking. Uh, Genesis tells us the story of creation, right? Day through six is one through six is real busy. On day seven, what happens? Rests. And there's a lot in that. The first thing is a king rests when his enemies are defeated. Right, so some, one of the statement is when God creates, there are no rivals. So God can rest because there is no one to threaten this realm. The rebellion comes from within God's own ranks, right? That's where that begins, right, when things go wrong. But there's, there is no, in the garden, where right, we've done with the fall stuff. But um, that's part of what I think we also capture in Jesus, this idea that um, it's not frantic activity that is salvific. Uh, there's a part of uh, being human that requires this rest uh, and restoration. So, yes, absolutely. Great, great, great insight. I just talked a long time so they would all think it was mine. <laughs> you brought it. It's great. one other these groups on top, uh, periodically become unruly. Yep. And the more unruly they get, the more danger it is to him because he is human. Yep. So he, he has a tendency, and in John you read where he sends his people to the boat, yet he goes away to pray. Mm -hmm. And so he recognizes that a little bit of him to a large group yeah, so I, uh, what Mike's saying is that uh, it was dangerous, uh, the crowd. I think in lots of ways it's dangerous to the communities themselves, right? You're talking about small villages. Uh, you think about the, the, the mass of people, uh, like feeding them, which we'll see in a little bit, is a challenge. Uh, not this week, but uh, in weeks to come. So, uh, yeah, good, good stuff. Um, really good stuff. Uh, Remote places and pray. So if people want transactions, Jesus is going to keep offering them uh, transformation. Uh, be clean, he says. Uh, and so those, what's the important thing there now is the contagion is the cleanliness. In Jesus, those Levitical codes are still there, but, that what, but instead of the uncleanliness being contagious, it is the cleanliness that's contagious. Um, that's a potent uh, change in the notion that most folks in the first century would have had, maybe today. All right, 17 of chapter 5. One day, as Jesus was teaching, there were Pharisees and legal experts. Don't think like this isn't uh, Andy Griffith, my favorite legal expert, uh, or Matlock, however you want to name him in there. This is, um, uh, this is the same guy, by the way. I don't know if you know that. The same dude. <clears throat> Shocking, I know. Uh, he just later he went to law school. But um, so uh, it's that kind of legal expert. This is somebody who's a uh, legal expert in the Mosaic Law, though that would have some kind of, it's the constitution that's acronistic, but it's the constitution of Israel. Like it constitutes what they are as a country and kind of how the practice would go. So an expert in that would have political realities in Israel, but think more in terms of uh, scriptural knowledge, we would think. Sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, the power of the Lord was with Jesus, enabling him to heal. 
Just then, some men appeared carrying a paralyzed man on a mattress. And they're trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. The crowd made it impossible for them to get through. So folks who need to get to Jesus can't. So they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles, mattress and all, so that he had landed right in the middle in front of Jesus. <laughs> Laughter's right. That's exactly right. Can you imagine? Like, and one more thing about Isaiah. There's a dude right here now. Like, this, is even, this is more disruptive than a kid who doesn't want to get baptized. This is a big moment. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus saw what trust they had. Uh, if you're reading a different translation, NRSV says faith, um, which is a fine translation of the Greek. Trust, though, gets at something I think is really important because we, as uh, you know, Western uh, enculturated people, often think of faith as assent to a proposition. Yes, that's true, but trust is probably closer to what Jesus is looking for. Paul says faith is trusting or believing that God can achieve His promise. Right. So God's made a promise to us in Jesus. Faith means He's going to keep it. So the resurrection we see at Easter will be for those who are in Jesus, right, as well. That promise will be kept. That's faith. Not just that it could be true, but that I have confidence in it and trust it. He sees their trust. That is, they trust that if they can get in front of Jesus, something's going to happen. My friend, he said, your sins are forgiven. Whoa, we came to the hospital. Don't be talking about my social life. <laughs> right? I came to get physically healed. What are you doing talking about my sins? And when did you, did you talk to my mom? How do you know? The legal elders of the Pharisees, they began to argue. Who does he think he is, they said. He's blaspheming. Nobody can forgive sins. Only God can do that. Uh, John loves this. Lots of God, lots of the, the whole Bible seems to love this. It's just having people say things that are true they don't understand. Right? So this is a statement that the person, that's true, but they don't get it. Uh, yes, only God can do that. And let it kind of hang there. Jesus knew their line of thought. Why are you complaining in your hearts, he replied. Which is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But if you want to be convinced that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, here he turned to the paralyzed man. So the healings um, have a purpose. It's to show what happens when the kingdom of God comes near. It has a uh, transformative impact on the area around it. But the healing, and this is part of what the crowd's issues are, are ancillary side effects of the mission. We think, oh, that's the purpose. It seems to be like, this is just sort of like a, a side effect. This is, you know, uh, like the really fast, soft voice at the end of the commercial for the medication, may cause healing, you know. Uh, but the actual mission is this declaration of God's uh, reign and rule, like the lordship of God over his people and this uh, coming of the kingdom for all people uh, seems to be the core of the ministry and mission. It just happens to drive out evil, heal, because that's the effect of God being reign and Lord over those spaces and over those bodies um, all the way. Which is easier. I say to you, to the paralyzed man, get up, pick up your mattress, and go home. At once, he got up in front of them all, picked up what he'd been lying on, went, home, went off home, praising God. A sense of awe came over everyone. They praised God and were filled with fear. I love that combination. Praise you, Lord, but I am not okay with what I have seen. Like, I am disturbed deeply about what I've been a part of today. We've seen extraordinary things today. We don't understand them. Comprehension is not a part of this. But wow, that was something. They said uh, a couple things. Um, one, it's probably acronistic, but this echoes a story that I love in light of a very similar conversation that Peter has in Acts, also written by Luke. The story is Peter's going to the temple. Jesus has been resurrected. Pentecost has happened. Spirit's poured out. So that uncleanliness contagion is now inside of people. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It's the force by which Levitical codes are turned inside out. Um, the pattern of behavior now is shaped by spirit, uh, not by the uh, observance of the law. So he's going on the way to the temple, and he runs into the beggar, and the beggar says, you know, uh, I need some alms. And Peter says, I don't have any silver or gold. Silver or gold I have not, but what I give, I give to you in the name of Jesus. Take up your mat and walk. Right? It's very similar paralleled stories and very similar points Luke acts. All right? Well... Uh, I tell that because there's a couple things going on. One, it talks about how what Jesus is doing is leading to what others will do in his name. Um, but it also leads to a great story about uh, St. Francis. Francis of Assisi, you know Francis of Assisi? He looks a little bit like Donovan, apparently, according to the movie. Uh, he's like a 70s version of Francis of Assisi where he sings a lot. 
<laughs> I don't really recommend it, but um, if you're, I don't know, really bored on the weekend, you can check it. Yeah, don't do it. Donovan, yeah, right. So he plays and he sings. It's a, it's a musical. Uh, at the beginning, he, he, it's a true story that he is wealthy. He's a, a merchant, uh, a child of a merchant, which is this raising merchant class in the, the season of the, the world, Western history, and just wealthy, 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 but he sort of uh, isn't into it. And his dad doesn't get it, so his dad like brings him up. He has the sheriff arrest him and be like, can you imagine? Get my kids straight. Like that's, uh, so he brings him there and, and uh, he renounces his like, uh, family allegiance. And in the movie, strips naked, by the way, and sings Leaving Town. It's, it was very 60s, 70s situation. It was very weird. Um, I have no idea if he did that or not. But uh, he renounces his family, goes and like, you know, starts reestablishing chapels he finds that have been derelict and like, builds them. Right? Simple things, committed to them, blessing for others, kind to animals, all things you know about Francis. Well, uh, kind of renounces wealth. He winds up in Rome, the story goes, and he's talking to the Pope. And the Pope's showing him around Rome and all of its grandeur, and he says, you see, Francis, and Francis has been messing with this because he's been talking about being poor and loving people who are poor. And he says, look around. No longer must the church say, silver and gold I have not. And Francis says, yes, but neither can you say, take up your mat and walk. Ooh, is exactly right. That's the right sound. Uh, that is a Jesus juke of the highest order right there. <laughs> I said to say, this is partly what goes to the crowds, I think, is that Jesus, and I think Francis in the later story, is highly sensitive um, to the fact that we tend to, it's not that silver and gold are evil, it's that it's easy to believe in them. That's where our trust and faith winds up. And so the trust and faith of the crowd is, I want to get well. Not I want to know Jesus, not I want to follow him. Um, here, um, and this, if you've been around for some of our conversations church-wide, Pastor Holly and the communication, communications and the care and community group have used this as their central passage. But they point out that there's a community of people around this person who's hurting. So what we need in our lives is people who will carry the mat for us and we can't walk. Well, that's spiritually, emotionally, physically, whatever that is, to carry us to where Jesus is. Uh, so they talk about in all their ministries right now, they're over there talking about addiction issues. Uh, and, um, and all of us in here are square, right? There's no problems in here. Uh, we're good. I mean, sorry, we'll pray for them. Um, so, but they talk about coming from something, uh, uh, through something and to something. And that's what happens in this story. He comes out of this, you know, we don't know how long he's on the mat. We know he has friends that bring him to Jesus. And when he gets to Jesus, he goes through this healing thing. Not only just his physical healing, but his sins are forgiven, the heart, the heart in his heart, the wounds of his life. And then he's sent back home carrying his mat. And this is important because it means that even in the healing and redemption story, the past is still a part of what happens. Right? The wound becomes part of the story. He's the guy that's carrying that mattress when he goes home. He's not, he doesn't get to go home and pretend to be somebody else. He's going to be that same guy. Now he's to tell the story of what happened when he went to Jesus. And so, like right now, they're having people of our church giving witness and testimony to uh, their own journey with substance abuse. They're giving witness to what they've been through, so they might bring that to someone else, right? From, through, to. So like all of our caring and you know, stuff is built around that, that uh, we believe that when God heals people and God uh, uh, cleans people up, that... That is for a purpose, and that purpose has work to do evangel uh, evangelistically. Uh, I don't mean that word politically at all. I mean that as a sharing of the good news uh, with the world. Um, and so that's, that's very much what this passage is about. Questions, insights, comments on this? Yes, sir. Mr. McEnulty. So we talked about how the Pharisees were there, you know, listening to everything, and then they said again, um, that we have seen certain things that everybody's glorifying it. Does that mean the Pharisees were glorifying it? Well? Yeah. So we, we, we've had lunch. We know each other. Can I ask you, like, in your life, who have you had the most arguments with? Other than my wife? No, no. Not other than your wife. That's the right answer. Okay. It was an honesty test. He got it right. Uh, he said his wife. Um, so the Pharisees sort of come off like, like the Nazis on the History Channel, right? Like they're always the bad guys in the gospel. That misses something. They're really interested and curious about what Jesus is up to. Like they... There's a lot of similarities in their project uh, and what Jesus is saying, though some distinct differences that come up that are really important. Um, but they hang around. Jesus argues with the Pharisees for like three years, right, his whole public ministry. He argues with the Sadducees for like a week, and then he's dead. So they give you a little different tenor about how that goes. Sadducees control the temple. They're the elites. They're rich. They made a deal with Rome. Very different. They flip, he flips over tables, and they're like, we're not having this. Whereas the Pharisees, they're kind of around. And yes, yeah, some of them, clearly some of the folks that 
actually eventually follow were Pharisees. Um, so they're, they're one of the, of the kind of three groups we know of that were in existence in the first century, Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes, if you've heard that. Uh, Sadducees' position were, make the best deal with Rome, uh, let's keep the temple functioning, keep bringing your offering, we'll see you Friday. Um, that's a reference to worship on Friday. You're all with me. I would have said Sunday, but the joke wouldn't have worked. Okay, so, uh, and then the Pharisees were like, no, 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 no. Let's learn the law and the scripture well enough to live as holy people that God might not be given glory and we might restore holiness in the land. And the Essenes said, all of that's busted. We're headed out of here. We're going to make, a, you know, places out by the Dead Sea. So like the Dead Sea Scrolls were likely some version of those people that were storing things up because Jerusalem's broken, the system's broken, Rome's unredeemable, and we don't want to be a part of it. And Jesus sort of straddles a position between the Pharisees and Essenes. Like being baptized by John puts him close to that sort of, hey, all that's busted and broken. Except that Jesus doesn't stay in the desert. He walks right into Jerusalem and says, no, this belongs to me and we're going to put this right. But the way he talks about some of the law stuff, the Pharisees are like, well, that sounds close to right. And then he'll say something like, and that's crazy. Why'd you have to say that? Like, it's just one more step of uh, the claim about who he is and what he does. But no, it's, uh, I think, absolutely, I think the Pharisees are having a response. They don't understand it any more than, you know, the Sons of Thunder, which is a great name, by the way, Zebedee, uh, understand it just yet. Uh, and no one really does before Easter. I mean, that really is the sort of deal. But great question, and your wife, uh, I was going to check with her. I know, I know her, so make sure you answered properly. That's right. You, you argue with people who, I mean, you don't, argue, some people you don't know, you don't argue with them, not for long. You might have argued with somebody you don't know, but like that's a one-time affair. If you don't know somebody, you're not having four arguments with them. <laughs> or you're a poorly deciding person. I don't know how else to put that. You're wasting your time. Why you have, because you don't care enough to argue with them anymore. Like, but if someone lives in your house, you're going to have some conversations about things. You know, the first half hour is nice, though. I mean, like, but after that, you're going to, like, you know, you're going to figure some things out. Okay. Uh, great stuff. Good question about the Pharisees. People do it on social media all the time. <laughs> they do. But I feel like that maybe makes my point. <laughs> There's old, you know, there's an old saying about like if you get into uh, and you wrestle with pigs, okay, uh, yeah, right. I just think that's kind of what that happens. I just say, you know, uh, I've never had somebody come to my office and be like I'm looking for a new church because I was on Facebook. <laughs> that phrase has never been uttered in my office. Think, I meet with a lot of people. No one's ever said, you know, I didn't really believe this stuff, but somebody called me names on Facebook and I thought I'm going to check this Jesus guy out. Like, I just don't think that's super effective. So, you know, use your energy other places, but you know, y'all do you. Um, so, uh, arguing. People do it on social media. Yeah. All right. Questions, comments on 5 through? And we'll pick up 17. No, we're not 20. We're done in 27. 27. All right. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Follow me. Remember tax? We, we talked about this. Tax folks, not popular. Traders to their people. Collect money. Put a little extra on there. It's like IRS plus the mob. Right? right? Like put that together and be like, that is not my friend. That's Levi. Pay up or the Romans are going to rough you up, right? Uh, follow me, he said. And he left everything and got up and followed him. I really wish he'd say, you know, I would make you uh, taxers of men. But he didn't uh, say that. <laughs> Levi, well, he, this would have been he does. Levi made a great feast for him in his house. Levi is wealthy. So if anybody tries to tell you Jesus doesn't love people of means, uh, Levi is evidence against that. Uh, Jesus loves poor people, maybe even prefers them. Uh, but there is kind of an over pendulum swing that says Jesus wouldn't hang out in wealthy bills. He hangs out with everybody. Uh, this is a social leper who's got money. That's who a tax collector is. And a large crowd of tax collectors were all there at the table. I love this. Levi invited his friends. He followed Jesus. He had this encounter and he said, you guys have got to meet this guy. Uh, he talked to me like I belonged in what God was doing in the world. And so you can only imagine. And then he set up a feast and said, bring your friends. Come on over. I want you to meet Jesus. Amen. The Pharisees and the legal experts began to grumble. I love it. <laughs> Jesus' disciples. Why does he eat and drink, they asked, with tax collectors and sinners? Healthy people don't need a doctor, replied Jesus. It's sick people who do. I haven't come to call the righteous. I'm calling sinners to repentance. Which sounds like exclusive, except when you remember, that's everybody. <laughs> right? It's the people who think they're well that don't get the treatment they need. Right? All right. John's disciple, oh, this is the retort. John's disciple, that's John the baptizer, right? Often fast and say prayers, they said to him. And so do the Pharisees' followers. They're better than your people because your disciples... 
Oh, they like to drink a little. <laughs> That's what it says. They eat and drink. Can you, <laughs> I love you. Can you make the wedding guests fast? He replied, this is the actual party. The bridegroom is with them. But that time will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. That's when they will fast. Which it seems to say, Jesus admits that later on in the practice of being Christian people, they are following Jesus, whatever language you want there, they're going to fast. But right now, I'm here, and this is part of the party, and we're going to feast. Um, I will say this. Even in... Israel's history, whole sections of Deuteronomy, which is like the book of the restatement of the law, right? Whole sections, chapters of them, are on how to throw the party properly. If you think what it means to follow Jesus is to be sad and dour uh, and with no joy, you have missed some good news. It's good news. We have more reason to party than any people who have ever lived because death has been defeated. We have all of this good news, and if you think that means you need to go through life going, I just am the worst, and this is bad, I mean, then Monty Python got it right. <laughs> You've seen that scene, right? God shows up and like, oh, we're so sorry, we're so sorry. He says, stop saying that. All you ever say is you're sorry. God doesn't want you to be sorry. God wants you to be different. It's different. Right? Being sorry is a feeling you have about something you keep doing. Repentance means stop. Don't go that way. It's bad for you. It hurts. It hurts other people. Go the other way. That's repentance. Uh, Jesus is calling you to life, abundant life. Come that they might have life, and that life abundantly, eternally. Uh, this is good news. It's a party. Now, there are times to fast, discerning and other times. Uh, early church clearly fasted. Um, Lent is a great time for fasting. He added to his parable, nobody tears a piece of cloth from a new coat to make a patch on an old one. If they do, they tear the new one, and the patch from it won't fit the old one anyway. And nobody puts new wine in old wineskins. If they do, the new wine will burst the skins. It will go to waste, and the skins will be ruined too. You have to put new wine in new skins, and nobody who drinks the old wine wants new. I like the old, they say. Jesus is an appreciator of uh, aged wine. Uh, I don't know about the, I don't really know enough about sewing uh, to tell you much about how cloth works there, but um, wine in the ancient world would still be um, in the process of developing, however language you want there. And so if you put it in a container and it was full, it could burst that as it continues to let off uh, gas and other things that would happen during that natural process, what Jesus is saying. Was that? We have a chemist in the room that can tell us how that goes. Uh, or a venter. Um, so he's saying that uh, this is a moment, this wedding is a moment between the ages, the old age and the new. Um, and he is uh, that elbow sort of season. His coming is the turn between the age. His cross is sort of the opening door of that. Um, questions on that before we have the Sabbath? We talk about rest, and now here's the formal day of it. One Sabbath, Jesus was walking through some cornfields. I just, it's like field of dreams. <laughs> right? Jesus is walking through the fields. And I love this. His, <laughs> his disciples... We're plucking and eating ears of grain and rubbing them with their hands. They're just like walking through somebody's fields and grinding. They like, don't have a mill, so they make their own. Why, asked some Pharisees, aren't you doing something that is, isn't permitted on the Sabbath? Haven't you read what David did, replied Jesus. When he and his men were hungry, he went into God's house, that's the temple, uh, or the, at that point, the tabernacle, and he took the bread of the presence. Were you aware that there was bread of presence before communion? In the temple, which no one but the priest was allowed to eat. He ate some and gave it to his companions. The Son of Man, he declared, is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, Sabbath teaching, he went to a synagogue and was teaching. A man whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. So they could find an accusation against him. Maybe he'll do something amazing and cool and nice. Let's catch him doing that. He knew what they were thinking. Get up, he said to the man with the withered hand, and come out here in the middle. And he got up and came out. Let me ask you something, Jesus said. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save life or destroy it? He looked around at all of them. None of them say anything. They don't know. They know you keep the Sabbath. They don't know what it's for. They don't know what it's for. Yes, sir? They're talking about these 600 and some odd laws that they have added like, you know, you can't work on the, or on the Sabbath, or you can't walk so far. Is that what they're talking about, some of these laws? So, to restate what you're saying, you're asking about, is Jesus having an issue with the hedge around the law? Um, the hedge around the law being the additions of new restrictions so that you wouldn't even get close enough to the actual law to break it. Right? So, the, the idea is to keep you far enough away. Like, it's... Um, protection from getting anywhere close to... Like, you don't use the Lord's name in vain. 
And so you just don't use the Lord's name, and that way you can't use the Lord's name, and you wouldn't say it. Or uh, the law says it is improper to uh, eat a baby cooked in its mother's milk. Yeah, but aren't they talking to these laws that they have added on? They're more like human laws that they've added to the laws of Deuteronomy. Right, right. What I'm saying is, so that's the law is written. The law is written is that don't don't cook a, a baby in the mother's milk. Um, <coughs> Which has led to meat and dairy don't go together. It's a broadening of the, which is, I'm, I'm trying, yeah, absolutely correct. So I think we, this will be repeat for some of you, but I think it's important if those haven't heard it, heard it. The sort of, the law is good. The law is not bad. So Christians have sort of fallen in the habit of talking about the law and the law is gone, we washed away, and Jesus came to undo the law. Actually, Jesus said that not a, uh, he uses the Hebrew dot and jittle, but it means not an I that would be dotted or a T that would be crossed is going to be undone in the law absolutely fulfilled, not washed away. But what seems to have happened is, uh, and we're going to get the bowling analogy, so you can all line up for this. Um, we have any bowlers that are here? Oh, you, I love how excited you were. See, that's awesome, because other people, they wanted to do it, but they don't believe in themselves like you do. They didn't put their hands in the air. I love that. All right, so we got our lane right here, and so you're going to have to help me, all right? Um, and uh, I'm at the lane here. There's the little arrows. I'm going to count the boards like I know what I'm doing. Uh, and what, what am I attempting to do? What am I trying to do when I'm bowling? It is right. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm trying to knock some pins down. Thank you, Al. Let's, let's slow it down a little bit. I'm looking for maximum pins to fall down. A strike would be optimum, but let's be real. Is this a league game? This is not a league game, Steve. Stay with me. Uh, <laughs> Y'all are fun. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm bowling, on the, I'm bowling on, the, uh, on the lane. The, the job is to uh, knock the pins down. All right, uh, we've got the boards right here. So everything's good. Now, if you haven't been in a while, it can be very helpful. If they fold up the little metal things, and those are guide the guide rails? Guide. I call them bumpers. What do you call them? Gado. Gado? No, the gutter. 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 Oh, the gutter. Okay, yes. The gutter is there to block the gutter. I got you. We're having a cultural exchange here. This is fantastic. Um, all right, so the gutters are there, and then the, um, the, the bumpers keep the uh, ball in the lane, right? And it makes it easier to knock the pens down. And, you know, if you have the inner 12-year-old, you can slam it off one and bounce it off the other and see how many pins you can get knocked out, right? All right. So the gutters don't change the point of the game. The point of the game is to knock as many pins down as possible in the 10 frames that you get, right? Um, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and so that's what you're trying to do. The bumpers make it easier. The bumpers are the law. The law in the Old Testament are bumpers. They keep people from falling in the gutter. They keep you where you can play the game. Right? And the game, going back to the beginning, is knowing God, being loved by God, having a people, his place, and his presence. That's what God wants. God wants to hang out with you. And you think, you have a bigger plan than that. No, actually, that's it. God really wants a relationship with his creation and his creatures. We think, ah, oh, there's got to be something up there. What's the other part of the deal? That's the whole thing that goes wrong. God really wants that. And we think, there's got to be something else. What's the catch? Um, and so what happens is two mistakes take place. One, what you mentioned is the bumpers get thicker and thicker. And they get so thick that people can't play anymore, which is basically what Jesus says when he says, you, for the sake of your tradition, keep people from God. Right? The bumpers have gotten so thick you can't knock the pin. You can't know God. They're too, you're too choked in the lane. And so, yes, I think Jesus does react not to the law, but to how thick the law has gotten. Or we forget what the purpose of the bumpers is. The game isn't to not throw things in the gutter. That's not the game. Because you cannot throw it in the gutter and get one pin. I've done it plenty of times. <laughs> right? That's not the aim of the game. The aim is to knock them all down if you can. That's what you want to do. The gutters can help you. But, I mean, the bumpers keep you out of the gutters. They can help you. So what I think the Pharisees can be guilty of is they, they no longer focus this way. They turn, and then the bumper becomes the focus. So that it isn't that keeping the Sabbath will mean you have time and space to remember who you are and why you are, as we talked about with Jesus earlier. That doesn't happen. It's just I'm keeping the Sabbath because that keeps me from falling in the gutter, and that's not the point of my game. And that is a, that's where the mistake comes. The law is a mistake if it's the point. But as a gift of God, it's absolutely all the things the Old Testament say it is. It is a gift. It is help. It is a guide rail to keep people in the lane where the good things can happen in their life. But the point of the game isn't not to throw the ball in the gutter. Um, and now we hear this, like in the kind of, uh, the church can fall into this. Not if we think first century Jews, you got this wrong. The church can do this. Um, I joke oftentimes that like I thought that every other youth group lesson was don't smoke or chase girls or drink. 
And then later it was like, well, you know, you can smoke cigars and drink a little, but don't chase that many girls. I mean, like, so you changed as you got older, but like, that was sort of the, that was the gospel. Is it? No. Right. And I was telling these stories, and my favorite line, I think some of you heard me say this, somebody who grew up uh, in the late 50s told me, in his day it was, I don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls that do. <laughs> Love that. That is so fantastic. Damn, that's a life lesson right there. Don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls that do. Things will be all right for you. Never get into a card game with the guy with the last name of the city, and you'll be fine. Uh, no. Um, it's a Teen Wolf joke. That really that wasn't super relevant. Um, so this is, the, uh, <laughs> this is what I think happens, and that's the same thing where we think that what we're re staying out of the gutter and not doing things, which, by the way, some of the things in those, those lists we make are adding to the bumpers. They're not in the book. We add them. Uh, and that is possible for us, too. So we need to make sure we realize that God's moral code and guidance is good. It is for our good. And yet it's not the point. It's just so that we can go on the way to life, not the way to death. Is it legal, Jesus asks? Is it better to do evil or to give life? The Sabbath exists not so that somebody will keep it. People weren't made so that they could keep the Sabbath. That's an inversion of purpose. The Sabbath was given that people might be what they were supposed to be. I mean, the Sabbath seems like you know, an annoyance to us. But hear it if you'd spent the last three, four decades as a slave in Egypt. And suddenly now, every six days, you're telling me I get a day off? I mean, this is a, this is a union win of all time right here. They had no days off, uh, no retirement plan, no pension. You had early death and heartbreaking labor. And God's saying, to be my people, what I'm going to need you to do every once in a while is remember that your effort won't fix the world, so rest. Oof, it's good news. Uh, and I'm trying to think of the rabbi. It was one of the, in the UK, they asked him what was the, what's the greatest Jewish contribution uh, to Western culture. And he said, the weekend. <laughs> and I think that is an awesome answer. I wish I could remember who said it. I was like, that is so fantastic. Uh, the idea of a weekend. Yeah, pretty good. Well done, you. Um, that rest. And Jesus is saying, you think not doing something is the point. Uh, it is a, not the point. It is a way to make sure you stay inside of who you are and why you are, which Jesus is doing too, right? He pulls away and goes and prays in a silent uh, place. Remember what the enemies um, challenged to him in the temptation in uh, is it Luke uh, a couple chapters ago when he says, if you are who you think you are, right? it's all about identity. Who and why has got to stay in the core. That's where the, the power is uh, in the spirit, both for Jesus and for us. Um, did we even finish that section? We did? Yeah. Okay. They flew into a rage. <laughs> Discussed with each other what they might do with Jesus. How dare he heal people? We've got to stop this. <laughs> John's gospel is even more pointed. Uh, this, this kind of inversion, not only of cleanliness and holiness, but of like the trial that's ongoing. Jesus, when he uh, raises Lazarus from the dead, that's when first somebody goes, we've got to kill him. <laughs> Their response to, he's bringing people back from the life, we can't have this, let's kill him. <laughs> Not like this is fantastic news. Um, all right, and that part of that is, goes to the Beatitudes. Let's do that 12 through 26 here. It happened around that time that Jesus went up into the mountain to pray, and he spent all night in prayer to God. He's doing it again. When day came, he called his disciples and chose 12 of them, calling them apostles. Simon, whom he called Peter, which means rock, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and Johns, and Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the hothead. <laughs> That's so great. I just wonder, like, where in Luke's notes that was important. Like, yeah, he was the hothead. Let me write that down. Judas, son of James, he's all right, but Judas Iscariot, who turned traitor. He went down the mountain with them and took up a position on a level plain where there was a large crowd of his followers with a huge company of people from all of Judea and from Jerusalem and from the coastal reach of Tyre and Sidon. If you've been doing your map work for the trip, uh, Tyre is coastal uh, plains. We're in the hill country, um, and you head over towards the Mediterranean Sea to the west. You're headed west for those people. They've come east now to hang out with Jesus. They come from all over uh, to hear this story and to be around him. Um, they came to hear him to be cured from their diseases. Those who were troubled by unclean spirits were healed, and the whole crowd tried to touch him because power went out from him and healed everybody. He lifted up his eyes and looked at his disciples. 
I just have this, like, I don't know what he's doing. I mean, you sit to teach in the Jewish tradition there, but I also think maybe all these people are crowding around going back to Gilpin's point, and he's just like, he looks up, he looks up his eyes and then like, <sighs> let me tell you how this really works. Blessings on the poor, God's kingdom belongs to you. Blessings on those who are hungry today, you will have a feast. Blessing on those who weep today, you will be laughing. Blessing on you when people hate you and shut you out, when they slander you and reject you as if it was evil because of the Son of Man. Celebrate on that day. Jump for joy. Don't you see in heaven there is a great reward for you? That's what your ancestors did to the prophets. But whoa, Methodists generally stop at 23. <laughs> We love the blessings. The woes make us really uncomfortable. Like, well, that doesn't sound like being nice and chicken. We like chicken and being nice. But woe to you, rich. You've had your comfort. Woe betide if you're full today. You'll go hungry. Woe betide if you're laughing today. You'll be mourning and weeping. Woe be tied to you when everyone speaks well of you. That's what your ancestors did to the false prophets. All right. Basic concept here in the Beatitudes that's the fundamental sort of good news message. Uh, and you can see the morning class heard this too. All right. I know. Get ready for some amazing art. It's about to happen. All right. So the world that Jesus is talking to looks like this. All right. So these are Romans. And that would have its own hierarchy. So you have like actual citizens, Caesar himself. Then you got like folks like Pilate who are governors, uh, who are derivative powers of Rome. Then you have like Herod and his control and the Pharisees, I'm sorry, and the Sadducees that control the temple. All right. Make sure you, this is all going to be on the final. Uh, <laughs> There's no test. Some of y'all seem really anxious about that. All right. And then you have, like, you know, maybe you have uh, uh, rulers in, in different principalities and cities, uh, towns and villages. You got folks with a little money and coin, maybe small business uh, fishing operations. Um, folks here. And then you got poor lepers, um, you know, sinners, widows, orphans. Those folks, all right? This is the way the world's structured that Jesus is talking to. And what he says is, you folks, I got good news. This whole thing is upside down. It isn't the way God wants it. He's going to flip it. And this is fantastic news for everybody. Except for these people who like the way the world is. And you start talking about flipping the world right side up because it's upside down. And the people who rule an upside down world don't like the sound of it. Which is why the Pharisees, he argues with, who are around here somewhere for a long time in his ministry. The Sadducees, who have cut a deal with Rome, it's a week-ish. And he's brought up on some pretty serious charges pretty quickly. Um, this, is, uh, this flipping starts to look like this. And that's the, the blessings and the woes. Which, by the way, it can be good news for Romans, too, if they'll hear it if they'll hear it and accept a different world that they're not in charge of, but instead, Jesus is in charge of. If Jesus is Lord, even the Romans get to come in, which we see in Acts pretty quickly. Romans start saying yes to this offer, even though it means a certain kind of power that they don't have. Uh, Paul, when he writes to uh, uh, Philemon about Onesius, the slave, right, talks about how, yes, I know, but legally you own this, and but see him instead as a brother in Christ. Which our modern ears say, why would Paul even mention slavery? He should, you know, totally say something about it. But what he said is even more radical. He said that it, the status that you thought before, once you're in Jesus, is altogether altered. The Beatitudes are about a world being flipped right. Which, by the way, when you get put right side up, if you've, been, if you've been hanging by your feet your whole life, and then you get yourself right side up, you're going to be dizzy for a little bit. It's going to take some orientation. Um, so if you think, like, man, this church thing's kind of strange and feels weird at first, it is. And it does. Because we've been hanging upside down for so long, we don't even know what normal and good feels like. We don't know what actually is good for us. Um, and so that's why the wisdom of the saints that have come before us and tradition of others around us is helpful to us. So this is the Beatitudes graphically displayed in life-changing artistic beauty. Your laughter hurts my feelings. All right, verse 27. But this is my word, Jesus continues, for those who are listening, love your enemies. Oh, I like this good news bit till you said that. Do good to people who hate you. Bless people who curse you. Pray for people who treat you badly. And in some like Sunday school abstraction, we all go, yes, that's lovely. But then when you think about real people, this is radical. I mean, people say, oh, yeah, you should forgive. Like, until you had something to forgive. Like, if somebody hurts somebody you care about, then you know how profound forgiveness can be. Um, if someone hits you in the cheek, offer him the other one. 
But this is what all you can quote when they talk about Jesus being a pushover and easy. I always think it's amusing that they pick this passage. You ever been hit in the face before? It's been, a, it's been a while, but I have. And my next thought wasn't, I hope he hits the other cheek now. <laughs> that would be a super follow-up situation. Uh, all right, yeah. If someone takes away your coat, don't stop them from taking your shirt. Give to everyone who asks you and don't ask for things back when people have taken them. Whatever you want people to do you, do that for them. That's the golden rule, right? If you love those who love you, what's special about that? Think about it. Even sinners love people who love them. These people get transactional relationships. I'm inviting you to be in a transformational relationship that's different. The economy of it works different. Or again, if you do only good to people who do good for you, the whole Roman system is built on something called patronage, which by the way is coming back. That's just odd to me. Like, all right, it's retro. It's 2,000 years old. Uh, let's have people pay other people to do other, you know, it's just a strange thing. Anyway, um, maybe it never really went away, and I was being idealistic, uh, but it's certainly back formally uh, online. All right, so uh, patronage, the idea that, like, rich people pay other people to do things they want done. Um, even senders uh, do this. Uh, if you lend only people to expect to get things back from them, what's special about that? Even sinners lend to sinners to get paid back. There's no like ancient banking system. In fact, really, until the modern world, the idea of like lending for an economic gain was seen as a sin. I don't want to hurt any bankers' feelings in here, but like that's a, that was a big deal, really a struggle in Europe, even in the Middle Ages, around how to do that. And I realized that there's all kinds of economic benefits to having a fluid economic structure, but. Uh, the idea of lending would come from people you knew, not from institutions. No, love your enemies, do good, lend without expecting any return, which isn't a lend, it's a gift. Your reward will be great. You'll be children of the highest. He is generous, you see, to the stingy and wicked. That is, God gives the rain and the wicked's farms as well. You must be merciful just as your father is merciful. Don't judge and you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good helping, squashed down, shaken in and overflowing. That's what will land in your lap. Yes, the ration you give to others is the ration you'll get back for yourself. Now, I don't think this means that God is saying, if you get cheated in business, I'll make sure that you get more money tomorrow. What he's saying is, if the world cheats you, abuses you, take advantage of this, trust me. I'm doing this, and in the end, the blessings I have for you will outweigh any um, uh, cheat that happens to you in this life. And uh, how much better would the world be if people actually function this way? But it's a radical challenge to love our enemies. Now, loving our enemies doesn't mean liking our enemies. You don't have to like your neighbor. You're told to love your neighbor. That's different. Like your neighbor is like natural. You don't have to work at that. Loving your neighbor is an act of will. Which, by the way, would help a lot of relationships when we realize how much our will is involved in loving. Liking, oh man, liking is, uh, sometimes our eyes get us to like real fast, right? Or we're into the same stuff, so we like to have fun together, so we like each other. Love is different. Love is an act of will in choosing the other person over ourselves. That's hard to do in a pattern of life that Jesus is inviting uh, his followers into. Jesus told him this riddle, verse 39. What do you get when one blind guides another? Both of them fall into a ditch. This may sound familiar. We read this Sunday. Students can't do better than their teacher. When the course is done, they'll be just like the teacher. Why look at the speck of dust in your brother's eye when you haven't noticed the plank in your own eye? Uh, I like the, in our, the log translation because it's like the idea of somebody walking around with an oak tree just sticking out of their forehead. If I can say, I see the speck. Dear brother, let me take that speck out of your own eye when you can't see the plank in your own you're a fraud. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You see, no good tree bears bad fruit, and nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree is known by its fruit. You don't pick figs from thorns, nor do you get grapes from briar bushes. The good person brings good things out of good treasure of the heart, and the evil person brings evil things out of the evil things in the heart. What comes out of the mouth is what overflows from the heart. So why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? I'll show you what people are like that come to me and hear my words and do them. They're like the wise man building a house. He dug, went down deep, and laid foundation on rock. When the flood came, the river burst its banks all over the house, but it couldn't shake it because it was well built. But when people hear but don't obey, that's like a man who built a house on the, uh, on the ground without a foundation. It looks good at first. When the river burst over it, it fell down at once. The ruin of the house was devastating. A couple things. One... 
Jesus is asking us to see the world differently. This whole business about eyes and planks and sins is a metaphor, but it's often an invitation to see that the lens on how we understand reality, when it runs through this beatitude thing, sees things differently. That even our enemies, even the person who hurt people, hurt you and hurt people you care about, are somebody for whom Jesus died. That lens is different. You don't have to like them. You don't have to spend every waking hour with them. You don't have to want Thanksgiving to last any more than a day with your brother-in-law. I get it. Um, but that lens changes how we view reality and other people. And we can't see that clearly when we're too busy trying to mess with somebody else's eyes and how they're seeing things. It has to go for our eyes first. Get the logs and the two-by-fours out of our own vision so that we might properly see and then we might actually be some assistance to our neighbor. And, this is pretty key, this will come up over and over again in Scripture, the way we act reveals what we truly believe. The way we act reveals, makes manifest, if you will, what we really believe. That is to say, if a church says, man, we really care about children, we love families, and at every event, there's no child care, we don't mean it. That's simple. We don't mean it. The parents are like, that's right, you don't. I need some child care. <laughs> this is my time. Uh, if we say, you know, we care about schools, and then Lock Hill, who sits in the shadow of our steeple, gets no support from us. They do. But if they don't, then people can say, you don't really mean that. You don't really believe it. Right? Your beliefs reveal what you really mean. It's the fruit that bears in your life. It's individually and uh, collectively. It's a bit like, I mean, some people talk about faith like, one day I'm going to move to France. But like five years later, they don't have a passport. <laughs> they don't know anything about France. They don't have a ticket. They don't know the language, right? Like, I want to be, oh, yeah, 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 I follow Jesus. Like, well, where's he going? Right? So he's doing some of these things, and so that's the challenge, I think, implicit in the, look, you, in the house may look like everybody else's house, but in a time of testing that comes, if you're really not built on the foundation of actually doing what Jesus is about, the reality gets revealed. Other insights on that? So again, this is not about earning your way. Everybody gets, man, Protestants get so scared about this. We're going to earn our salvation. <laughs> No, we're going to reveal that we're being saved anyway in the behaviors that we have. Jesus is not going checklist. Uh huh. All right, that's four points. The Jesus point system isn't real. You're all with me, right? Like that's a joke. <laughs> it's all grace all the way. But when we really get caught up in this, we our behaviors, our actions are altered by this because when we see the world is altered. Okay. Um, I think we have one more section here, and we're just about out of time. Um, Jesus told them this riddle. I already read that. Right. We're good. All right. We got good. I can stop and ask y'all, let y'all talk. Okay. We are up against it. So what do you got? What insights? What reflections? Any thoughts? Yep. This Jesus guy is interesting, isn't he? Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Nobody? I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Littlefield, I apologize. I'm messing with you. I have to read it. I love his point. Um, oh, we're yeah. What page? Talking right real. Makes. Yeah. 77. Um, it says they were trying, he's talking about the, teacher, te the rival teachers of Jesus, and I just thought this was, he said they were trying to make Israel holier and holier as a way of separating their nation from other nations. Mm -hmm. But the point of the law and the prophets was to make Israel the light to the nation. Man, prepositions matter, don't they? Yeah. That's prepositions. Is somebody here from, in, yeah. from and to? Okay, good. Something a squirrel can do to a house. That's prepositional phrases, right? Above, around, to. Okay. Uh, absolutely right. So she said, and read Wright's insight, that uh, back to the, our bowling analogy, um, and this is still true, by the way, ultra-Orthodox, observant uh, Jewish folks in Israel are trying to raise the righteousness in the land to a level that the Messiah will come. Right? We're still, there's still a second, not all Jewish folks would use that Messianic hope language, but ultra-Orthodox, law-observant Jews in Israel sure do. They're waiting for the temple to be rebuilt and the Messiah to come and build it. And it will happen when the righteousness in the land, the holiness of Israel, is this bright light kind of city on a hill idea. Not for, but from. Right? That's different. This is Paul's argument all through his letters. That the calling of Israel, the childhood nature of, of people of God from Abraham, right? We're all children of Abraham. Was children according to the promise. And that promise in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, is that the descendants of Abraham would be a blessing to everyone. And this is true now. I think God does all kinds of blessings. Amen. But blessings come with responsibility. 
This is where like the prosperity gospel that you hear it gets it half right. I think that's part of that's true. It's just that if God enriches you in some way or has some talent for you, then you're the steward of that. If you're good at building businesses or uh, teaching class or whatever, how you use that gift, you're the steward of that. Yes, you're blessed. And that blessing will come with all kinds of good things. But those good things don't just belong to you. They're for the service of this community we've been sent to. And these folks want to hold on to it. These folks want to say, let's multiply it and share it. Um, and this is who we're supposed to be, by the way. Uh, the last shall be first. Have you heard this language before? The first shall be last. All of this stuff is, is in there. I'm out of time. Are y'all having fun? Yeah. yeah. Y'all are the best looking Bible study group. I'm just looking around going, I just had not noticed prior to this moment how good looking all of you are. <laughs> Let's pray. God, I thank you for uh, people hungry for your word. May it sink into our hearts that our fruit is born in the behaviors you built us for, that the world might be blessed, that we might not only know heaven to come, but heaven breaking in, that abundant, glorious, and eternal life would be ours now and forever in you. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great night. We'll see you. Thank you, Dan.